So as a dungeon master, you have to decide what happens and how things unfold. Decision making is often done by a roll of the dice, and herein lies some of the magic of this game. But there are so many stats, numbers, tables, how do you know what to do or when to roll or what to look up when making a decision? Okay, new Dungeon Masters, this video is for you. And for those of you who have run a few games, you may want to stick around to see if any of this helps you streamline what you already know. Today, we're talking about the most critical decision-making factors in the game. Checks, saving throws, and difficulty class. So let's start with the single most iconic item in the game of D&D, the D20. Now the D20 goes all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome. Here's an example of the earliest known D20 from 300 BC, and here's one from Rome. In 1974, the D20 started a new journey as Gary Gygax introduced the D20 into the game system of Dungeons & Dragons, and you, the new DM, will use this die to determine how your story with your players unfolds. Now, given the importance of this die, along with its varied beauty, I should probably take a brief moment to introduce you to... The Dice Goblin. If you have not fallen in love with the allure of dice yet, well, hang on to yourself because your inner dice goblin is in there waiting to come out. Now they come in all sizes and materials and you will likely have more than one set in no time at all. Now I am planning to do a dice video around the obsession and allure of dice and even possibly the making of dice. And I'll add a link here when that video is complete. Now the 20-sided die is used more often than any other die in the game, and it is used for everything from combat to determining if you can persuade that shopkeeper to give you those healing potions at a discount. Most of the time, when a DM tries to determine an outcome, the D20 is helping make that determination. And if you hear me make a reference in this video to making a roll, I'm talking about this die. So let's start with checks. Now, as a DM, you will ask your players for an ability or skill check when they want to do something that has an outcome with consequences. Abilities and skills are numbers on your character record sheet that determine a character's framework. Now, if you as a new DM are unfamiliar with these aspects of the character record sheet, I'm gonna be making a video on that soon. In the meantime, you can look at the player's handbook chapter seven for more information. To try and eliminate some confusion right out of the gate, many pre-written game scenarios will call for a specific skill or ability check in a given situation. So the decision for what check to make is sometimes made for you. Other times, like in homebrew scenarios, the decision is on you. So what does this mean? Well, say your group approaches a crevasse in a cave that is three feet wide. One of your players, who is playing a gnome, says, I jump over the crevasse. Now this is an exceptionally easy jump to make, even for a gnome, and it may not be worth the time to have them roll to see if they can do it. You as the DM can simply say, you jump the crevasse with ease. However, if the crevasse were slightly larger, say four to five feet wide, and your party is being chased by some bad guys, you could see how this situation could create some consequences for the gnome. This is a scenario where you, the DM, would ask the player to roll an ability or skill check. Okay, so let's break this down, what making this check entails. What type of ability is the action associated with? Jumping, especially a crevasse, would require some strength, and some timing, and some coordination. This seems more like dexterity than just pure strength. But let's get even more detailed. If you check your player character sheets, you will notice a list of skills, and next to them, a bunch of mathematic modifiers. These skills are more specific than the straightforward abilities. So take dexterity, an ability that generalizes coordination. One's dexterity could be applied to a dance move, picking the pocket of a guard, or shooting an arrow 300 feet into a goblin. These are all very different situations that all point towards dexterity. Skills, however, offer an opportunity to fragment dexterity into different areas. You might be better at hiding or stealth than you are at acrobatics, and the skills list is what details this. Okay, so when you're trying to determine what your player will roll an ability check on, like a skill, look at the skills list. Look at the various skills that have a dexterity connection and see what fits best. If nothing fits just right, you could ask your player for a straight up dexterity check. Now, once you determine the skill or ability that this outcome is associated with, you have to decide how difficult the task really is. 
Now the DM determines how difficult the task is and assigns it a number. Now this number is known as the DC or difficulty class, and it is the number that a player has to meet or beat on their role in order to accomplish the task. The Dungeon Master's Guide for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons has a table in Chapter 8 that states, A very easy task would have a DC of 5. Easy at 10, moderate at 15, hard at 20, very hard at 25, and nearly impossible at 30. How does one roll a 30 on a 20-sided die? Well, actually, this is where the player character's modifiers come in. So a skill in acrobatics might have a plus two modifier because the character's dexterity is 14. But the character may also be proficient in acrobatics, adding another bonus to the roll. Let's go back to our gnome and say this is a level one character, making their proficiency bonus plus two. Now, you the DM determine that a five foot wide crevasse is not a gimme for a gnome, and they're running, scared because there's a big bad breathing down their necks. I'd say the crevasse itself is easy, a DC 10, but the baddies in pursuit up the ante a bit, turning this into something more challenging. In my mind, I'm going to set that DC at 14, and I don't necessarily tell my players this. So I would ask the gnome for an acrobatics check. Acrobatics combines a number of dexterity components in my mind that include agility, coordination, and a skill set around hurling your body through the air. Your player would roll the d20 and add all the modifiers that they have associated with acrobatics. This is noted in the skills menu and any other external modifiers. Now, let's take it a step further. I don't want to overcomplicate this, but let's just say our gnome has a magic ring that gives them a plus one to dexterity checks. Your player would need to remember all of this and add them together to the roll. Now, let's be clear. If any of this sounds too overwhelming, stay with me. You should know that your journey as a DM will only get easier. These checks, rolls, DCs, and all that stuff will become second nature before you know it. All right, one more thing. If you like this content and you want to hear more, please like and subscribe to this channel. And most importantly, ask me questions in the comments. And like I always say, don't be afraid of asking the questions of a newcomer. I will defend your curiosity. And I'm going to delete comments from the self-aggrandizing folks who enjoy starting sentences with... Actually, you know the ones I mean. All right, let's get on with our gnome here. Now, we have determined that this jump, while in pursuit, has a DC or difficulty class of 14, and that we're asking our player to roll an acrobatics check. Perfect. The player rolls a d20 for their gnome. And it's a 9. <laughs> but wait, there are modifiers. Let's see. The gnome's acrobatic skill is a plus four. That's plus two for dexterity and plus two for their proficiency. Your player may remember the ring as well, and that makes the roll of a nine a 14. The gnome will make the jump, and the players will rejoice. Here's a DM tip. The players did not know what the difficulty class of this jump was. You, the DM, knew that this gnome barely made it. So work this into the fiction, the narrative. The player will roll, add the modifiers, and say, I rolled a 14, and then look to the DM for an outcome. If it were me, I'd describe the jump on a 14 barely making it as follows. In the heat of your fleeing the ferocious gang of flesh-devouring orcs, you spot the crevasse and instinctively leap, not entirely knowing if you can make it. Your front foot misses the far edge, and your body slams into the side of the drop, arms scrambling to find purchase barely do, and you quickly pull yourself up and continue your sprint into the darkness. Of course, the narrative you would describe would be much different for the result of a 12, a natural 1, a 23, or maybe a natural 20. But this is where your flavor as a DM comes into play, and I'm going to leave that up to you. Okay, now you have an introductory understanding of what a check is and what difficulty class or DC is. Let's move on to saving throws. Now these in general practice are very similar to checks. There is a roll made with a d20 that is measured against an ability or other stat to determine what happens. Most often, a saving throw is made when something is directed at another player or an NPC, and this result determines that person's ability to avoid the consequences. If you look up the spell Fireball in the player's handbook, you will see the following. 
A bright streak flashes from your pointing finger to a point you choose within range, and then blossoms with a low roar into an explosion of flame. Each creature in a 20-foot radius sphere centered on that point must make a dexterity saving throw. A target takes 8d6 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. In this case, the dexterity saving throw determines who's able to jump out of the way of the approaching fireball or not in order to avoid taking full damage. You can see that even if someone makes the saving throw or succeeds, they're still taking half damage. This is because realistically, the spell is instantaneous and nobody would be able to fully avoid it. But what is the number that the players are looking to roll here? In the last section, we talked about difficulty class being determined by the dungeon master's discretion. With saving throws, at least ones scripted by the book, the numbers are usually given to you. For example, let's look at who is casting Fireball in this case. So let's say our party that just jumped over the crevasse and is on the run has a wizard in its ranks. Let's name her Ruth. Ruth is a fifth level wizard and knows the spell Fireball. She decides to turn around and cast it at the approaching enemies. And since they're all clustered in a group as they run, this spell seems ideal as it targets a large area. The enemies in the area the fireball hits would all have to make dexterity saving throws. And the number that they have to meet or beat is the wizard's spell save DC, or difficulty class. Now in essence, the fireball's effectiveness is based on the wizard's stats. The spell save DC for a wizard is 8, plus their intelligence modifier, plus their proficiency bonus. Now a smart and proficient wizard will have a more difficult fireball to avoid, which makes sense. So let's take a look. Our wizard has an intelligence of 16, giving her a plus three modifier to intelligence, and she's a level five, giving her a proficiency bonus of plus three. So eight plus three plus three is 14, meaning any spell saving throw made by someone she targets will be a 14. Here's my moment of reassurance to you. A lot of these numbers, like modifiers to roll, spell save DCs, th these are numbers that the players have the responsibility of knowing, not necessarily you. And I'm guessing that if you're new at this, all of these numbers that I'm throwing at you right now, they're a bit intimidating. But realize not all of this falls on you, the dungeon master. So take a breath and realize that you will get this. Okay. So Ruth pauses, turns, and faces the approaching horde and says, I cast Fireball and center the explosion on the middle of the running group. Whoosh! The fire leaps from Ruth's outstretched hands, illuminating the walls and ceiling of the cavern as it hurls towards them. So the DM's next move here is to see who makes or fails the dexterity saving throw inside a 40-foot diameter area. Remember, the radius of the effect is 20 feet, so that's a pretty big diameter. Now you have two choices based on your style of play. You can either make a single saving throw for all the members of the horde at one time, which could be a little unfair, but it's gonna save you a lot of time and it's gonna allow your narrative to flow more smoothly. Or you could make a saving throw for each member of this horde, calculating who saves and who fails, which is more my style and I would keep a chart of that written down right next to me here. Whichever one you do, it should be known to your players before you all start playing so that you're consistent in your practices as a DM and your players know what to expect. All right, so boom, the fireball explodes and there are bodies scampering and flying everywhere. How much damage was sustained? So let's just say for the sake of argument that half of this horde of orcs failed their saving throw and the other half succeeded. So at this point, the dungeon master now rolls 8d6 or eight six-sided dice, and adds the total. So let's take a look. Okay, so I got five, nine, 12, 18, 24, 29, 35, 37 points of fire damage. Okay, 37 points, and anybody who failed that saving throw in this case, half of our horde, they're going to take 37 points of fire damage. The half that succeeded will take half of that number. Well, half of that number is 18.5, and typically we round up. So they're gonna take 19 points of fire damage. Now, I said earlier that these were orcs that were in pursuit, and your typical everyday orc from the Monster Manual has 15 hit points. That means that whether or not they saved 
on this saving throw, whether they succeeded or not, is irrelevant because they're going to be taking a minimum of 19 points of damage. They all die. So clearly, Ruth made a clutch move here and saved the party from what could have been a difficult fight. In all, the spell saved DC of 14 against Dexterity, aka the Dexterity saving throw that the baddies had to make to see if they avoided the consequences. Avoided, okay? So saving throws are about avoidance. All right, so let's sum this up. A check is a role that is made when we need to determine an outcome that has consequences. In short, did the thing happen or did the thing not happen? Pretty simple. A saving throw is made to determine if the roller avoids a consequence. In short, I don't want this thing to happen. Do I avoid it? Lastly, DC stands for difficulty class and sets a number that we roll against to determine the outcomes for both checks and saving throws. Now beyond that, it's up to you how your fiction and narrative describe the way these roles turn out. Make it less about pure math and a little bit more about story. The dice and all of these numbers that we're setting function to help that story grow, flow, evolve, and embellish. All right, Dungeon Masters, hopefully this helps you. And remember, you've got this, okay? This information and a ton more will slowly cement itself into your knowledge base as you actively play more D&D. So get out there and organize a game. All right, I'll see you soon. Take care.